the reason people embrace systems of central control is that they believe is that they either are grifters and manipulators and they want to control people, or they believe that humanity is evil and needs to be controlled. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Devin Erickson, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Well, thank you for having me on. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, you were recently recommended to me as a guest for the show. Um, I guess I will give credit where credit's due here. This was by at Mr. Squirrels on Twitter. Uh, who goes by the name of More Cowbell, and your Twitter handle is your name Devin at Devin yes. underscore Erickson underscore. And so, just by way of quick introduction, we were getting to know each other a little bit here before the show. Um, you are the author of the recently published science fiction novel Theft of Fire. Yes, yes, and I. Uh... Go ahead. And you've been dropping some pretty monumental Twitter <laughs> replies, responses, et cetera. So as you were recommended to me and I started to read some of your work, uh, I was very interested to talk to you. So perhaps to get started, you could just tell my audience a little bit about yourself, um, your professional background, yes. your journey into becoming a science fiction author. And then we'll jump into some of your written work. Well, I, uh, I was actually the son of one of the lead engineers on the uh, Voyager spacecraft project at JPL. Cool. So I grew up kind of in this, in this atmosphere of looking very closely at what the future might look like. We had uh, all these photographs of the outer planets that my father had helped take, uh, you know, hanging up around the house, and I uh, hung out as a kid at all the JPL Voyager press conferences, and I had the sense that, okay, we're going to go out there someday. We're going to have a look. And I was very much a science fiction fan, and so, you know, I wanted to write science fiction, went as a teenager, and then adults said, oh, honey, th you know, that's, that's kind of a stupid dream. You should do mm -hmm. something practical. <laughs> so... I wound up as an engineer for many decades and uh, 
when I retired, I decided, well, you know, I can do what I want. <laughs> so I sat down and I started writing and I created some visions of what the future might look like if we continue our current path and start colonizing the near solar system and, you know, move out there, keep developing AI, keep developing society. What is that future society of 100, 150, 200 years from now going to look like? Mm. And what kinds of things are going to happen in it? Mm. So I, you know, I threw in a few fantastic elements to make it fun, but that's kind of where the story is set. Very cool. And I, I have read some of your stuff on Twitter, but I have not yet read your book. Mm. And you said it was just recently published, right? Yeah, yeah. November 11th. So we've been okay. out for about three months if now, it. something like that. Like Based that. on the title, Theft of Fire, I'm guessing there are some Promethean themes. Is there anything oh, yes. you can tell the audience about the book without giving away anything too much? Oh, yeah. Well, it it, uh, it really is about humanity's journey as a species and also about the character's journey as individuals. And these two mm -hmm. things kind of mirror each other. So it's planned for a four-book series, and it starts out kind of small with, you know, boy meets girl, girl blackmails boy into going on a treasure hunt. <laughs> <laughs> Hijinks ensue. And then it kind of ends up in the technological singularity in the fate of the galaxy. So mm -hmm. we have a long way to go. But if you like science fiction at all, I definitely recommend checking out the book because the Twitter threads were just me ranting in an hour. This was something I sweated over for a year. Awesome. Very cool. Um, I always like to ask writers about this because I am, an as I guess I would say, an aspiring writer. I've published some things on my blog, but I've never published a book. Well, you, you've written, you've gotten paid for it. You're a writer. Okay. You're a professional writer. Then I am well, a writer, officially, but I would say a struggling writer because I, where I struggle is to maintain a consistent writing practice. I find it... I find like I could basically do one thing well, like as we were talking before the show, I'm fortunate to have really good multitaskers around me that support me, but I can basically just do yeah. one thing at a time. So when I'm in podcast mode, I'm in podcast yeah. mode. When I'm in writing mode, I'm in writing yeah. mode. I have trouble yeah. balancing the two. Do you have any tips, tricks, techniques for aspiring writers in terms of well, regiment, big technique, et cetera? No one can tell you how to write. They can only tell you how they write. Mm. And what's important about that is that writing is basically taking the world inside your head and making it understandable to other people. Mm. And there's as many ways to do that as there are heads and worlds within them. Mm. So I can't tell you how you should do that. But what I can tell you is that you will struggle with writing no matter who you are until you find a process that meshes with who you are. In my case, it was watching a series of lectures on writing fantasy and science fiction given by fantasy author Brandon Sanderson at Brigham Young University. Hmm. And he put these on YouTube for uh, free. And... Years later, I was noodling around YouTube, and, you know, I I had dabbled in writing before then. I wrote some really good scenes, but I could never quite piece things together into a novel. And, and that's about 10 hours, 12 hours of video, so I watched it over a couple of days, and that was what really kind of ignited it. I said, okay, I can do this. Mm. This process makes sense to me. And I sat down, and I started writing, and I kept writing, and I finished. And I discovered along the way what my process was, which is to use software engineering principles to write stories. Mm. You know, I have everything checked into source control. I have, I have it structured in a software spec. I have function contracts for scenes. I have unit tests. I do bug tracking. It's, it's, it's very much keyed into the same kinds of processes I used as a software engineer. Very cool. Are you doing 
I, but you have to find something that works for of you. Of course. So are you, I mean, just out of curiosity, are you doing this consistently daily, same time every day? Is this full-time job? Is this whenever you can squeeze it in? Like, how do you approach uh, it? Well, I'm retired, so I have that luxury. Mm-hmm. And... I have my family to help me handle some of the other business parts of being an author, of which there are an incredible amount. Mm -hmm. You really wouldn't believe it until you see it. So I do have to divide my attention between cultivating and shepherding publicity, things like writing on Twitter, appearing on podcasts, going to conventions and talking at panels, this kind of thing. Mm. But on my writing days, I try to get a thousand words a day. That is that a lot. not generally considered a lot for a professional writer. Yeah. But when I, when I say a thousand words, I don't mean just like any sort of dribble. I mean, mm-hmm. really curated, edited a thousand words, okay. you know, because again, I was, I was, a I was a core programmer. I was working often on the kernel level. And, you know, when you, when you're doing that kind of programming, it's, you're lucky to get 10, 20, 30 lines of code a day. They have to be the right ones. So I kind of approach writing like that. Okay. So you're writing and editing simultaneously. Uh, to some degree, to some degree. Yeah. I do a lot of prep work. I, when I start a novel, I typically write 25 to 35,000 words before I write anything that the, the audience is going to see. Gotcha. All of that is outlines, summaries, you know, function contracts for scenes, notes. And so by the time I'm writing the actual words... I don't have very many decisions left to make. Gotcha. And that's what helps me to work with instead of silencing my inner editor. Got it. Okay. That is super cool. I've heard the thousand words a day thing from many writers. Mm-hmm. That seems yeah. to be a point of consensus. And as you were saying that, it reminded me of, I think maybe it was Abe Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Give me 10 hours to chop down a tree. I'll spend the first nine sharpening the ax. Sounds like yeah. you oh yeah do that yeah. Your, your prep process yeah. yeah um okay thank you for sharing that let's jump into some of the stuff that i've discovered of yours which is your your writings okay. on twitter these might be uh less polished writing for you because i think they're <laughs> they're pretty uh r- i don't want to say ranty rant has a negative connotation but they're very let's just say they're passionate passionate replies yes. to Stupid comments on Twitter. So I'll start with a for instance here. You're replying to uh, Ashley Ruba, PhD, who wrote, a PhD should guarantee a stable job after graduation. There's that dangerous word, should. A decade of post-secondary education should teach you fundamental job search skills. A degree conferred to less than 2% of the world's population should lead to a six-figure salary. Um, I really don't like the word should, as I was sharing with you offline. It just oh, yeah. applies yeah. this moral superiority or intellectual superiority. Uh, it can be a dishonest way of saying I want. Yes. Yes. And so that's exactly what this tweet yeah. translates yeah. as, right? She wants yeah. a six-figure salary. She thinks she's mm-hmm. entitled to it yeah. because she got a yeah. certain uh, PhD. Yeah. Well, it's the labor theory of value. Mm-hmm. It's... I did X amount of work. I jumped through the hoops. Now I should get the, uh, you know, the treat. Yeah. As if the universe were this sort of, uh, like, like a Skinner box mm-hmm. where you do the task and the scientist gives you your food pellet. Mm-hmm. And that's not really how the universe works. And that's not really how value works because you can labor at anything. Yes. You can labor at something absolutely useless. You can dig big holes in the desert and fill them up again. Yeah. That doesn't add anything meaningful to the quality of life or civilization. Yes. So, you know, I was talking about how this is the labor theory of value. The labor theory of value is the basis of Marxism. 
you know, it mm-hmm. Marxism being based on this idea that everyone should be rewarded in the proportion to the amount of work that they do. And, you know, however we measure works, well, which I don't know how it would do that. And, and I introduced, you know, an, an alternative, what I call yes. the fuck theory <laughs> of value. If I may, uh, I'll, it's a long reply, but I'll read one excerpt of it here just to give people a flavor of the passion in the reply. Um, and Lord, don't strike me for this one because I'm just reading the excerpt. You open with Jesus fucking Christ. Now that you've gotten that PhD in developmental psychology, how about you try undergoing some psychological development? Like actually entering Piaget's formal operational stage. Here's your first lesson. The universe was not designed as an incubator for you in particular, Ashley. It's not one great big Skinner box designed to give you a puzzle to solve and then dispense some sunflower seeds to reward you. It's just a bunch of stuff floating in space, and on that stuff there are some people who have no idea who you are and never made any promises to you. Did you ever stop to think about what money really is, Ashley? You know, the stuff you're demanding 100,000 units of, from that uncaring universe. Money is a measure of fucks given, Ashley. In fact, it should be called the fuck and not the dollar because no one is going to give you a fuck if they do not if they do not give a fuck. And you think people should give a fuck because you put in a whole bunch of work. Well, you put you can put in a whole bunch of work at anything, Ashley. You could dig big holes in the Nevada desert and fill them back in, as you said earlier. So there's the the intro yeah. into a slightly yeah. longer, yeah. passionate reply. Yeah. Yeah. And I really appreciated the novel definition of money yeah. uh, as a, a measure, measure of, of fucks, fucks given. given. Yeah. I mean, if we want to think about this from the primitive roots of property and exchange, you know, you've got two guys in a paleolithic tribe agronac and tholo and agronac is is you know is, is very athletic and he goes out and hunts things and tholo is kind of an autist and he sits by the fire chipping away at little rocks but those are spear points and agronac needs them and so Agronac gives a fuck about what Tholo is doing, and Tholo gives a fuck about what Agronac is doing because he likes to eat. Mm-hmm. And so when there's just a small bunch of people, we don't really need any sort of token. We can just keep track of the fucks mm-hmm. we give in our hand. But as we start to have more and more things and do more and more complicated stuff, this mental ledger got replaced with some sort of token of value. And, you know, this started with like the barter system and, you know, there were certain goods that were very convenient to barter with like Mm -hmm. gold stuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, eventually we settled on tokens as a means of keeping track of fucks given. Mm -hmm. But people get confused about money because they see it as a token so often and they don't really realize that it's a ledger. Mm-hmm. It's a ledger of who has done what that we give mm-hmm. a fuck about. Mm-hmm. And so now when we start inventing systems of money that use this blockchain, and I think that's a terrible way to refer mm-hmm. to it because you know the blockchain is how it works. It's not what it does. Mm-hmm. You know What it does is it's a verifiable spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. It's a verifiable spreadsheet of how many fucks we give about each store of value because of what was put into it that we give a fuck about. Mm-hmm. So things like Bitcoin are almost going back to the origins of what money was supposed to be mm-hmm. and supplanting this sort of more primitive token technology yes. which caused a lot of problems like you know you can go and and point a gun at someone and say mm. give me your tokens yes and then you're you're defrauding this hypothetical ledger of value 
Yeah. Well, you know, what Ashley is saying in here is, is, you know, I should get this many tokens. Mm -hmm. But what she doesn't understand is that these tokens represent fucks given. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing something that you care a lot about, that you give a fuck about, but nobody else gives a fuck about, then they are not going to give you fucks. You know, you have to, you have to put your own fucks into it. That's right. You know, they're not going to pile up a hundred thousand fucks for you to do this thing unless they have a hundred thousand units of fucks given about it. Right. So, you know, I'm a science fiction writer and I write little stories, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's kind of frivolous. It's not too important. And, you know, the only way I pay my bills is if I manage to scribble down something somebody gives a fuck about. Mm -hmm. That's how it's supposed to work. I don't get to say, I wrote for two years or I wrote for one year, give me some money. No, I have to, I have to produce something that people care about. Yes. That's what money is. Yes. Yes. No, it's wonderfully said. And the stone age vignette is useful. Um, it's all about human cooperation right in terms of scaling our productivity yeah it's about investment it's about yes. w- we put our time and effort into something and we produce something that has value as measured by how much of a fuck other people yes is. and the more we trade the more we can scale cooperation the more each of us individually can specialize in one yeah. tiny yeah. thing yeah. And then simultaneously benefit from all the specializations of others. Right. Yes. So it's, it's, yes. it's, it's, this is what makes it, us so successful yeah. as animals. Yes. It, it organize, it's how we organize how we fit our efforts together. Yes. Exactly. So it's a coordination and, of human effort. Yeah. 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 And the only alternative to a system of fucks given like this is uh, some sort of central planning committee. And if you think those work, Crack a history book. Exactly. Exactly. And so to your point, the original form of money, like, and this is in even Graeber's book, he gets a lot of things wrong, but the original form of money were just IOUs, right? It's like, hey. is The original form of money is respect. Yeah. Res- yeah, yeah. So you bring down an yeah. animal. I respect so you- Olo because he makes really good spear points. Yes. And the- so... <laughs> and so he gets a big piece of mammoth meat. <laughs> yes. Because well, we want that to keep happening. Right. Because there's an, I, you respect him because he provides the spear points you need, right? So yes. there's an IOU yes. built into, yes. oh, yeah, I brought those mammoth, here's some mammoth meat. Absolutely. I expect you to give me some spear points tomorrow. Yeah. So yeah. that system. You of, do what I care about. I do what you care about. Yes. Everybody gives a fuck. Favors like that work, but only within the confines of like Dunbar's number, probably, right? 150. Yeah. yeah. Well, favors like that are what money is, Mm -hmm. but we need the more people we have and the more investment we have and the more value we have built up, we start to lose the ability to keep track of it in our heads. Exactly. So we invent tokens and then we start to lose the ability to keep track of it with tokens so we invent some cryptographic ledger, ledger technologies. Yes. But exactly right. It's we're tracking who has done what useful favors for others. Yeah. And who has then in turn do useful favors from yeah. others. Yes. We hit Dunbar's number with favors because we can't yeah. handle the cognitive yeah. load. So to get past Dunbar's number, we move into tokens. Yeah. Which basically the physical possession of these tokens provides an accounting system for this, yeah. the same tracking yeah. of favors uh, of who has done what work that others give a fuck about. And then eventually the physical moving of these tokens, right? Like physical gold coins, for instance, itself becomes an inhibition on the market process. Because when we're a globalizing economy, yeah. well, we need to send gold. Yeah, gold is heavy. Over telephone wires, ideally... Yeah. Which we, we never could do because gold's heavy. So what did we do? We put all the gold in one place. We put a dollar derivative on top of it, an electronic derivative of the dollar on top of that. And we, you know, have ledger entries basically between yeah. banks. Yeah. The problem with that, of course, is you put if all the money in one place. Central trusted authority. 
and then the temptation to profit by betraying that trust becomes too great. And you so you say, we're going off the gold standard. Yes. And, exactly. you know, we're going to print some money and give everybody an, an economic bailout and we're going to inflate the currency. And if you think yeah. that works, crack a history book. Yes, 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 exactly. <laughs> so you, you, need a, you need a form of currency, you need a form of ledger, you need a record of fucks given that no one has the ability to tamper with. Yes, exactly. So how, given this universal need for humans to cooperate and exchange, um, what, what do we say, relevant effort or, or yeah. useful, valuable effort, you know, effort fuck. that others give a fuck about, how does this relate to Bitcoin and or crypto in your view? Well, as I've been talking about, you have a you have a computerized ledger. You know, that, that's that's okay. You're not going to keep track of it with tokens because tokens can be stolen. Tokens can be counterfeited. Mm -hmm. Tokens can be counterfeited by the issuing authority, which yeah. is why your dollar doesn't go as far as it used to. Right. Um, so the, the thing about cryptography is that it provides this, this wonderful capacity to have things that no one can do. Like if you've got a public and a private key and you will have the public key, you can encrypt things, but you can't decrypt them. Mm -hmm. So cryptographic technology provides not just ability, it provides inability. Mm. And the one of the one of the things that a blockchain type ledger, a blockchain type, it's really just a giant spreadsheet. Mm. That what this way of making a giant spreadsheet provides is it provides an inability for any one or small group of people to tamper with. Uh-huh. And that means you are getting rid of this security flaw in your ledger of fucks given mm -hmm. where you have this central authority that you have to mm -hmm. trust. Mm -hmm. Because any central authority that you have to trust will eventually betray you as you accumulate value. Right. And the reason for that is it, says it has nothing to do with the people. It's just the more value you accumulate the more this storehouse of value gets piled up, the more it becomes more and more lucrative to loot the storehouse yeah. instead of profiting by adding to it. Yeah. So when you when you, you know when you get Fort Knox, when you get a central bank, mm -hmm. when you get this top down money supply, it's not about who you have in charge. It's about eventually someone mm -hmm. will succumb to temptation mm -hmm. and they will cooperate with others who mm -hmm. succumb to temptation. So the real challenge for creating better systems of keeping track of fucks, mm -hmm. you know, for, mm -hmm. for creating a better fuck mm -hmm. is something that you can't tamper with not because you are a trusted person mm -hmm. or because there is an oversight committee, but because you simply mathematically do not have the power to do mm -hmm. so. Yes. You can't counterfeit Bitcoin. You can't issue more Bitcoin and inflate it. And, you know, I see a future of, and I may differ with some Bitcoin aficionados on this uh, topic here, I see a future where there are a good deal of different sort of cryptocurrency type ledgers representing different underlying assets. Hmm. For example, how about you have a stock-backed cryptocurrency where instead of having a centrally ledgered stock market, your company's stock is tracked 
as a blockchain ledger. Mm -hmm. Now you effectively have a cryptocurrency which is backed by the sum total of the stock of your company. Yes. Now that um, is something that's widely discussed in Bitcoin and crypto circles. Um, I think the one, the nuance here though is the actual act of backing. Because like what we just said, right? You can yes. have a dollar backed by gold. Yes. But that creates this temptation. At some point someone's going to, follow their profit motive and raid the storehold of value by printing uh, more dollars or uh, engaging in scourage, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. So the question is, how do you maintain the peg between the stock and the cryptocurrency? Now, I th mm -hmm. there's a lot of crypto bros that would have a million answers to that. But, I think the Bitcoin answer is you can build those types of contracts, small yeah. contracts, but they have well, there's always, top of Bitcoin. there's always a peg and you know, on the large scale, that peg boils down to consensus. Yeah. Because when you have something like Bitcoin, it has value because people agree that it does. Yeah. Remember, fucks given. Yeah. If people stop giving a fuck, then your currency is valueless. And the way that these ledgered systems are superior to tokens is because for that that uh, that uh, linkage between the cryptocurrency and the real world value to be lost in a token, you just have to have the central issuing authority lose faith in that contract or betray that contract. For a cryptocurrency, certainly it can happen. If everybody were to agree tomorrow that Bitcoin was valueless, then it would be. Mm -hmm. But you ha in order for that to come uncoupled, you have to have a widespread consensus. Mm -hmm. And the more, the more widespread the consensus has to be, the more stable the peg. difficult it is for bad actors to manipulate this. And we see the same we see the same sort of thing with uh, technology in in human history. You know, it's society is controlled really by the way technology mediates who has to be part of the consensus for someone to hold power. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have a medieval England, if you have a feudal system, you have a king with a small number of landed nobility reporting to him. And, you know, each of them has a number of knights reporting to him. And all you really need to hold ultimate power over the society is the consent of this relatively small number of people. And that's because the military technology of the day is mm -hmm. the armored knight with a lance mounted on his war horse. Yeah. And armor is expensive. Yeah. War horses are incredibly expensive to raise and train. And so it requires a lot of money to have admittance into this community of people who matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll get this back to Bitcoin in a minute. So then when firearms come along, and more importantly, when the rifled firearm mm -hmm. comes along, now a peasant with a tube can knock your armored knight right off his horse from 200 meters away. Yeah. Now you have to keep a lot more people happy yeah. in order to wield power in society. And all of a sudden, people have these ideas like, oh, democracy, republicanism. <laughs> well, direct consequence of the firearm. Yes. So now, because the, the, the ability to wield force is so widespread, Societies used to be controlled by force, mm -hmm. but now the ability to wield force is very widespread. So, you know, what are the three ways to get somebody to do what you want? Force, deception, and persuasion. Mm -hmm. 
So now we have, we enter an era where control over populations is mediated by deception. If you can trick them, they will do what you say. <laughs> and now we have a situation where somebody invented the internet, mm -hmm. which is like the firearm mm -hmm. because it distributes control of information widely. And so we're starting to get into this era where you can't wield power by tricking people anymore either. Mm. And, you know, that's what this conversation is part of, you know, yes. debunking yeah. these yeah. myths of a benevolent central authority. Yeah. So now you start to enter the era of persuasion where you really have to wield power by inspiring people to follow your plans. Mm. And... You know, Bitcoin is is a little bit like the same kind of process in a different context because, okay, you have these, these token currencies, these fiat currencies, mm -hmm. which you only need the consent of a few people to manipulate them. Mm -hmm. And then along comes these crypto ledgers where in order to manipulate those, you need to get a massive amount of people marching in the same direction. Mm. So it's the redistribution of financial power in the same way that firearms redistributed the power of violence mm. and the internet redistributed the power of information. Mm. That's fantastic. I, I, familiar with the firearms disrupting the armored knight on horseback from the book the sovereign individual and that's one of the most excellent analogies i think for how the economics of violence influence the shape of social organization yeah I think it's very it's probably the most critical thing they call them mega political variables these are yeah. variables that yeah. transcend yeah transcend the politics. arrow of history is technology yes, yes. that's the one thing that that produces lasting change. Everything else is either static or cyclical. It's changes in technology that drive history. Yeah, and it's really almost all things are emergent from the technology, right? As you yeah. were just saying, yeah. even the moral codes, right? Chivalry the collapsed moral as a moral yes. code yes. once yes. firearms Absolutely. were invented. Um, Absolutely. And so I want to ask something you said there, but I want to recap some things you said first. So we have Bitcoin as this tamper-proof spreadsheet in the sky mm -hmm. by which we track fucks given worldwide right that would yeah. be like yeah in the in the long arc of monetary development that would kind of be the ideal situation yeah, yeah. maybe i mean who knows maybe there's other things yeah. but for now it's it's better than anything we've had before and the problem i mean i guess the well what bitcoin's doing that's so profound is that it's truly decentralized because the problem was centralization as you said, when we put this storehouse of wealth under the control of few people, you create this insurmountable temptation hmm. where eventually someone's going to follow their profit motive and just raid the storehouse versus yeah. doing something productive and adding to the yeah. storehouse yeah. of value. Yeah. And this makes sense, right? Humans will do, the way I frame this is humans will do basically anything for profit, right? Humans will kill yeah. for profit. Humans will well, harvest organs for profit. People humans want really manipulate to currency. I'm sorry, what's that? People want others to give a fuck about them. Yes. We all want people to care about our projects, care about our welfare, and that means giving a fuck. So it comes back to the storehouse of fucks. Right. Is this the Nietzschean will to power? Mm -hmm. Arguably, yes. I wouldn't put it that way, but I mm -hmm. could certainly see someone making an argument for that. Mm-hmm. I would say that it is it is the will to respect, to attention, mm -hmm. because ultimately everything boils down to other human beings mm -hmm. caring what we are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I chose to go and write Theft of Fire and the eventual sequels and to become an author instead of, you know, if I just wanted money, I'd start a religion or something. Right. <laughs> you know, right, right rob right. a bank. <laughs> yeah. You know, white collar crime. But it's there's a certain deep 
deep satisfaction in being an author because you you tie a bucket to a rope and you throw it into your subconscious and you drag it across the bottom and you pull it up <laughs> pour it out across the page and then if you're successful at this people read it and they say wow yeah that was that was amazing i approve of this and when it comes from you when it's all you when they say that they're approving of you yeah they're like wow you know this this thing that comes solely from you yes was amazing and you know there's two there's two things that produce happiness there's a feeling of accomplishment and a feeling of connection to other people mm -hmm. so you know i could i'm a smart guy i could have found some way to rob the store of value Mm -hmm. But that wouldn't produce a feeling of accomplishment right. and it wouldn't produce a feeling of connection to other people. Right. The way giving them something that they love yes. and having them give a fuck does. It would do the opposite, so, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think a lot of people, when they're trying to accumulate fucks, mm -hmm. they're chasing that feeling mm -hmm. and they're getting on in Twitter or Instagram or whatever and they're, you know, posing with rented supercars and, and <laughs> hired models and, you know, look at my baller lifestyle. It's really about wanting the approval of other people. Yeah. It's really about other people caring about us and caring about us and sending resources our way. So maybe the Nietzschean will to power is a subset of that, but it's it's really a desire for prominence in the community and the regard of others. Desire because, to have yeah. others give a fuck about yeah. you. Yeah, a desire to have others give a fuck about you. Yeah. Because what happens when people become billionaires? Mm -hmm. We see what their character is. Mm -hmm. Some of them just keep playing this game of, how can I accumulate more fucks and you know, <laughs> you, you know, get the high score? And, you know, some of them create charities where they're, they're going to, they're going to try to purchase mm -hmm. the esteem of others. And, you know, some of those charities do some real good and mm -hmm. maybe not so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're kind of scammy and kind of dystopian and yeah. Not and I'm I'm thinking of names, but I'm sure the viewers can think of those for themselves. And then some people just they build what they want to see in the world. Yes, like yeah, holy shit! I I won the start a business lottery. I'm worth sixty million dollars. What do I want to create? Yeah, and yeah, they're still trying to get other people to give a fuck about them. But they're trying to do it in a genuine way by let me create something that people care about and really love. Yeah. Yeah, I thought your point about the two generators of positive emotion being accomplishment or connection, human connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's pretty insightful. And I think you can only really actually achieve that through consensual free market activity. Because if you oh, yeah. try to raid the yeah. storehouse, but you're going to have this guilt, right? You're going to have this disaccomplishment. Well, even, even but you're also going to, you're going to alienate yourself from others, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've yeah. stolen yeah. from them basically. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, even if you are a complete congenital psychopath mm -hmm. and are incapable of feeling guilt at all, and you know, I would say there are a lot of those out there and not everyone is, ne well, every one of them is necessarily doing evil mm -hmm. because even if you're totally incapable of feeling guilt, you still care if other people like you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of people out there who don't have consciences, but there's there, those people still care deeply if other people like them. Yeah. So, this is why our political class, who are almost universally 100% 
a bunch of useless grifter parasites who are looting the store, they still spend a lot of effort trying to convince us all that they are morally upright, patriotic people who are doing this for the good of the planet. Yes. And the reason they spend so much time on that is, is yes, so they can get away with it. So but there's away. also some extra effort put in because the disapprobation of other human beings really, really hurts. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the... If you look at psychopaths, if you look at the ones that we identify typically because they're the low functioning psychopaths who kill people, a lot of them are killing because they're profoundly miserable, you know, who are killing because they can't connect to other human beings. Mm. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer killed, kidnapped and killed his victims in the attempt to create a to create sort of compliant zombies that's what he was trying to do if you look at some of the readings about him mm -hmm. so literally he's lonely mm. and he's such a psychopath that he has no empathy no ability no sympathy no ability to connect with other people so he's lashing out in this kind of frustrated rage. So, you know, in the same way, we have sociopaths in office mm -hmm. and, you know, what they're really doing is stealing from the store of value mm -hmm. and betraying the nation they're supposed to represent. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're out there chanting, Bidenomics is working. Yeah. Because it really hurts when... 350 million people are telling you you suck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great point. Um, I, I want to go back to something you said earlier. So the three ways to convince people, mm -hmm. force, deception, persuasion. Yeah. And how that drives changes in society. So fiat currency, right? This thing is inherently deceptive it's it's an oxymoron actually it's a debt based money and if money one of the definitions of money that's useful is that it's a tool that extinguishes debt so if you have a debt based money it's an it's it's a contradiction yeah. in terms essentially is that one of in your views would that be considered a deceptive means of wielding power because so long as people misunderstand the nature of money or the nature of fiat currency more specifically that they'll continue to fall for this scam of, you know, let me hold my savings in dollars while the Fed counterfeits them by the trillion. Um, and and the, it, the, the consequences go further, because if you consider, like, what is mainstream media, why is it so clearly false, yeah. right? Why are so many of the things yeah. on mainstream media well, false? Yeah, it's because way, it's yeah. bought and paid for yeah. with printed yeah. money. Yeah, the way this works is that the dollar is essentially a thing that has no tangible physical existence. It's you have this central bank that l literally just makes up something notional, like, you know, we're going to have three trillion new dollars and I'm going to lend them to you. And now you owe me these $3 trillion because I lent them to you, despite the fact that, that I just made them up and did no work to create them and added no value by creating them. Right. But now they are supposed to represent your work. Right. So I am going to do this shell game and give you something that doesn't exist. And in return... You are going to give me your labor, mm -hmm. your effort, your value, your things that you give a fuck about. Mm -hmm. Now, Bitcoin works a little bit like that too in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Somebody made it up. It doesn't represent anything real. But the difference is... 
nobody can make any more of it. Mm-mm. It's it's mathematically impossible. We well, have there's this work being done math. to create it. Yeah, that's the fundamental difference, yeah. right? Yeah, fiat's yeah. created with no work. Bitcoin's based on proof of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, there there's a limited amount of it that can be created, mm-hmm. mathematically speaking. Mm-hmm. So, what you have is you have this situation where y- you've essentially created a fiat currency. Mm-hmm. But there's no one in charge of it and no one who is capable of looting this store of value. Mm -hmm. So if we participate in the same sort of consensual hallucination with Bitcoin Mm -hmm. that we do with dollars, it can't actually be looted in the same way. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like okay, it's like this scam money, but no one's actually in charge of the scam. Yeah. And therefore, no one can profit off it. Mm. Yeah. You know, ultimately, yeah. you know, ultimately, we all have to consent that something represents value. Yeah. And if that consent is obtained through trickery because we don't understand the dollar, then you can profit by trickery. Yeah. But if that consent is is obtained by inspiration, then people can only profit through inspiration. And that's the end goal of these kind of technologies with a social imprint, uh-huh. is with a social impact, with a footprint, yeah. is that we ultimately want to create technologies that make it impossible to profit from force and impossible to profit from deception so that you can only profit by creating real value and persuading people that it is valuable and inspiring. Doing things people give a fuck about. That's the only way to make money versus undermining consensus or trust or these other things. So Bitcoin... Yeah, and when our exchange technologies develop to a certain level... And Bitcoin may is a step in that direction. It may not be the complete picture. Mm. But when we develop that technology to a level, you know, mm. force will start to be phased out. Mm-hmm. You'll see less war and violence because it's no longer it's incentivized. Yeah. And then later you see deception starting to be phased out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I... I agree strongly with this. These are themes we explore often on the show and you're giving me new language here to maybe to present it, but I see Bitcoin as a consent or a point of social consensus obtained by trust in mathematics, thermodynamics, and Darwinian self-preservation. So the mathematics is the cryptography, thermodynamics is the energy expenditure, proof of work mining. Darwinian self-preservation is, well, it's your incentive to hold and save in this thing and not get the base. Yeah. Trusting in proven sort of scientific effects that we can see in the world rather than trust in a particular individual or apparatus of state. Yes. So gunpowder moved us from the deception of the medieval church to the persuasion of democracy, maybe in really broad strokes, right? I would say that gunpowder moved us from the force of the medieval church mm. to the deception of democracy. Ah, even better. That's correct. And democracy that, is also a scam. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes. Democracy is another form of tyranny. So does Bitcoin so, then move us from the deception of democracy to the persuasion of entrepreneurship, something like that? I would say that it's one piece of the puzzle and it helps. I think there are others and not all of them exist yet. Mm. We're going to have to invent them. Gotcha. But I would say Bitcoin is one such invention. And even if it doesn't end up being money, even if money is some other cryptographic advance in the future that is even better, it represents both effort and progress in the in the technological creation of a world where all exchanges are consensual 
Yeah, I, you know, there's um, maybe even a metaphysical connection here because obviously Bitcoin is a system that cannot tell lies, right? That's yeah, it's it's the only system of unalterable transaction history we've ever created. Yeah, and then it's also very difficult to expropriate Bitcoin by force. Because it's just, you know, it's like keeping it's It's certainly more difficult. I mean, you yes. can do a certain amount of rubber hose crypt analysis, mm-hmm. but that's a lot more difficult than just taking a physical token by force or by stealth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's possible to steal your Bitcoin but it's a lot more difficult to steal your Bitcoin than it is to steal your car. And to steal your dollars, it's every dollar printed is a dollar stolen, yes. basically, right? Yes. So. The, the, do- the dollar is one of the most stealable stores of value there is. Exactly. Yeah. And I would argue that the changes that it has undergone, a lot of them have been to make it more stealable on this. Yes, 100%. And the central bank digital dollar or currency would be an extension of that theme, right? Because yes. even more stealable, surveillable, yes. et cetera. Yes. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. Okay, I want to jump into another one of your Twitter responses here. This one has to do with the tightness of feedback loops. Ah, uh, and, yes. and we're getting here yes. into the, I think, the core of the decentralization versus the centralization argument. You could even say like the free market capitalism versus central planning argument. Yeah. And a- another definition of capitalism is decentralized planning, basically, yeah. where everyone plans their own affairs. We don't yeah. have the top-down yeah. authority. Um, now... This reply I'm going to read, you're responding to one of your own tweets here, so I'm not really sure where to start. Uh, no, it's sort of continuing an earlier thought, I think. Continuing that. an earlier thought. I'll read just a little bit to start, and then maybe you could fill in the gaps here. You're saying that a further thought experiment on the ramifications of the way capitalism places the points of decision next to the relevant information it's not just about proximity or indeed expertise. It's about the times uh, of feedback yes, yes, of the yes, feedback yes, loop. Yes. One of the things I, I learned very quickly when I became a professional engineer was that the faster a mistake is detected and the closer to the point at which it was made, the faster and cheaper it was to fix. When I caught my own bugs, I could usually fix the code in minutes. If test or quality assurance engineers caught them, there had to be emails back and forth multiple people involved, and it took hours. If somebody let one slip into production, well, in the embedded systems world, pushing out a patch is horrifyingly difficult and expensive. So smart engineers, the guys fresh out of college, would try to think very hard and be really smart and not make mistakes. They would create vast architectures of code with sophisticated directed graphs on whiteboards and try to code them up perfectly. But wise engineers, the guys with some years on them, wrote code a little at a time, compiled every few lines, and had a suite of unit tests they'd run almost reflexively. Hell, sometimes we'd compile and run things we knew were incomplete, that we knew would not work just to get more feedback, like SpaceX launching rockets they know will blow up. Tightening your feedback loop, getting empirical information sooner rather than later, almost always beats smart and sophisticated 
thinking. Um, I'll stop there. And I would just, I know you said you hadn't read this, but a lot of my audience has. This strongly parallels Hayek's essay titled The Use of Knowledge in Society, where he's basically arguing decentralized planning or individuals acting on information particular to their time and place is always superior to any form of centralized planning. Because once you pass that information yeah. into a yeah. centralized institution and wait for the command to come back, the information has lost relevance. It's lost timeliness. It's degraded yeah. effectively. Yeah. Well, the important thing to understand here is that you don't succeed by being smarter. Mm. People often think of intelligence as the sine qua non of, of success. Mm. You have to be smart. You have to make smart choices. But that's not what intelligence does. Mm. The, almost the only function intelligence has is to enable you to learn things. Mm. What makes you succeed is possession of specific domain-relevant knowledge. Like, if lightning hits a transformer in my neighborhood mm -hmm. and the power goes out, mm -hmm. you know, okay, so I'm plugging in the backup generator mm -hmm. and it's chugging away, burning diesel, whatever, and I want to get the lights back on. Mm -hmm. You know, I can have an IQ of 175 mm -hmm. and I open up that transformer and, you know, How's that going to help me? Well, it might help me a little bit. It might help me electrocute myself, or it might help me eventually figure it out. But what I really need is to know a whole bunch of very specific stuff about how to fix transformers. Mm -hmm. How they're put together, how they work, how they fail, how to repair them when they do. Mm -hmm. So domain-relevant knowledge and not intelligence is the important thing. So whenever someone's going to try to sell you on their sort of socialist vision of the central planning committee, mm -hmm. what they always try to tell you when they're trying to introduce this politically is that they're going to put together a team of, say it with me now, the best and the brightest. <laughs> and the best and the brightest are very, very smart. And they all have Ivy League educations. Mm -hmm. And they're going to with the power of their superior minds going to solve society and run everything so it works. But none of them knows how to fix a transformer. Mm -hmm. And so they take control away of how transformers are built and maintained and fixed and whether we use transformers at all or some new form of technology mm -hmm away from the people who know about this specific thing. So you've taken the decision-making power away from all the edges of your graph mm -hmm. where you get to see the results of your actions in real time every day, and you pull them in and you put them in the hands of a central planning committee believe the term is Soviet. Mm -hmm. It's what a Soviet literally means. Mm -hmm. And that didn't work out too well for them, did it? Turns out that a bunch of very smart Soviet agriculture scientists decided that the peasants, who had only been growing, you know, food for 50 generations or whatever, what did they know? They didn't even have degrees. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't know how to grow food. So we're going to collectivize all the farms. And then all a bunch of people starved to death because it turns out that the peasants did know what they were doing because despite the fact that the scientists were smarter, probably, mm -hmm. the peasants, the peasant farmers, the kulaks, mm -hmm. had the relevant domain knowledge of how to grow stuff. And growing stuff is not easy. As Dwight Eisenhower once put it, farming is mighty simple when your plow is a pen and you're a thousand miles from the nearest cornfield. 
So what the free market, what anarcho-capitalism really is, is it's just the basic principle of leave decisions to those who are directly affected by them and know the most about them. Mm -hmm. You make decision-making as small and granular as possible. Mm. You're creating a massively parallel computing system mm -hmm. to solve economic problems as opposed to trying to centralize everything. Mm -hmm. If you like computers, you can think about it as the difference between the CPU and the GPU. Mm -hmm. Well, nowadays, all the exciting computing things are happening on GPUs. Mm -hmm. Massively parallel floating point units that produce all this nifty AI stuff that we're doing nowadays. And that is a lot more computationally powerful than trying to find a handful of the best and brightest and having them try to figure out how to run an entire society full of people when not only is no one smart enough to do that, they don't possess the relevant data. Mm -hmm. And anything they get is weeks, if not months, out of date. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and, yeah, right. yeah, and that's what that's why freedom is important. Yes, a lot of people when right. we talk about freedom, they think, "Oh, well, these people like freedom because they want to do whatever they want, and you know, we need to force them to do the right thing for the good of everybody." Mm -hmm. No, it's not just about what you want to do. It's not just about your quality of life. It's not just about desire for autonomy, although any of those things would be argument enough. What it's really about is that good ideas happen at random to everybody. Yeah. They don't just strike the central planning committee like they were right. some kind of lightning rod that attracts all the good ideas in the universe. Good ideas occur at random. So the idea is you just let all the people try shit. Yeah. Try crazy shit. Try weird shit. And you know what? 90% of them are going to fail. Yeah. And that's okay. They don't pull down society with them. Yeah. You know, you just have a small handful of people to succeed. And then you, everybody says, hey, look over there. Right. What he's doing is really working. Yeah. Let's all imitate him. Yes. That's leadership in a decentralized society. Yes. And the failure is useful feedback. Yeah. Right? It's not, yeah. If someone fails, then you've, you can observe yeah. and counter yeah. imitate, right? They've you know, still helped. Work. Yes. They've yeah. still helped. We've eliminated that approach now. Yes. Hey, I, they spent $2 million developing a water powered pogo stick and no one bought it. Exactly. Let's not do that again. Exactly. So this is such an important discussion because we're talking about feedback loops, which is the governing mechanism of all complex systems, as far as I can tell. Like there's not really yeah. linear arrows of causality. Everything seems to be feedback loops. Yeah. We see this most yeah. prominently in biology. Yeah. It seems to be- Everything that adapts to its environment or adapts its environment to itself must use a feedback loop to do so. Exactly. It and has to be empirical. Yes. And then so very important from- that standpoint, but then it also gets philosophically into the importance of freedom, right? Yeah. Both philosophically and pragmatically. Um, I want to, and this I think will tie into our later discussion on private property, which you've, you have a, a response on as well. And I want to throw some things out here. One of my favorite libertarian authors and philosophers is Hoppe, and mm -hmm. he defines capitalism as a universalized system of respect for private property mm -hmm. and the transfer for private property, consensual transfer of private property via contract, basically. Yeah. So everyone keeps what they earn and make and mm -hmm. they can transfer it with others that also own things. Yeah. He defines socialism as an institutionalized policy of aggression against private property. So this is the idea that you know, as you just said, with the central planning board or committee, there's someone that owns some piece of what you're doing more than you own it, right? Um, and now, when we print money, we are aggressing against the private property of savers. Whoever's holding dollars in a savings account 
is having their property aggressed against by the Fed or central bank yes. shareholders every time a dollar is printed. Yes. Printing money also degrades feedback loops and price discovery, right? This is the, the Austrian business cycle theory basically says that when you don't get the relevant feedback, if money's not transmitting feedback the way it should, and we're using yes. bailouts to paper yes. over economic losses, that you're giving- Don't know how to allocate, allocate resources. Exactly. Anymore. The economy gets bad feedback, capital gets misallocated, meaning that it's not in accordance with the preferences of market actors, yes. it's in accordance with the preferences yes. of some bureaucrat. Yes. And we all start doing useless work. We all start digging holes in the Nevada desert and filling them up again. Exactly. Exactly. And we end up with, obviously, bailouts, zombie yeah. companies, yeah. central planning of interest rates, yeah. et cetera. We end up with fiat yeah. world, basically. The, the tragedy of socialism is not that it is populated by stupid people, right. but that it incentivizes smart people to do stupid things. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So- the framing here, I think, would be the free market is a distributed computing system within which individual market actors are nodes. Yeah. Prices are a large extent of, I mean, obviously we use language to communicate, but we're also communicating yeah. through yeah. prices. Prices are signal. Yeah. Price signals. And freedom, to insert the philosophical piece, it's about optimizing for computational throughput. Yeah, in a, in a yeah. pragmatic sense, right? It's not just yeah. about people doing whatever it's they want. About it's the not, tight feedback loop. Yeah, yeah. It's it's about not disabling these computational nodes. Yeah, it's about allowing them to function at maximal efficiency. Yeah. and this whole thing is based on this robust notion of property rights, and that's where I think a lot of people who endorse socialism have a real sticking point because they're subscribing to this labor theory of value mm -hmm. where, you know, I did some work, whether it was useful work or not, I should be paid. Yeah. And they say, well, you know, the government does all this work, mm -hmm. never mind whether it's useful work or not, mm -hmm. you need to pay your fair share. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole notion of, your fair share of the payments as opposed to you having control over your property. Yeah. And one of the things they will say is, you know, where do these property rights come from? This is, you know, this capitalist who says that, you know, people who supply capital should control things as opposed to people who supply labor and so forth. And, you know, this is one of these things where in some of these writings, I really try to cut the Gordian knot here because people have been trying to sort of philosophize about property rights for mm -hmm. millennia. And mm -hmm. you know, where do they come from? You know, your rights are granted by God. Your rights are natural within you. You know, all of these sort of rationalization mm -hmm. and where rights really come from. And I'm talking about property rights here mostly mm -hmm. because those are the important ones is we made them up. Mm -hmm. We made them up. We just invented them out of thin air. If you split someone in half, which socialists are fond of suggesting we do, reveals their mindset. Um, <laughs> and and look for the property rights. We won't find anything physical, anything in there, in there that says, here are the property rights. Mm -hmm. We made them up. We invented them. Mm -hmm. But... We invented them out of need and we invented them for a reason because without property rights, you don't have civilization. Mm -hmm. You don't have technology. You don't have anything. You're yeah. out in the wilderness with a rock, a few sticks and some yeah. grass Yeah, because anything more than the rocks and sticks you have to invest in, you have to put effort in to make them. Yes. And people don't do that unless they get to control and benefit from the thing that they made. Yes. So anytime you weaken property rights, you weaken civilization. Mm -hmm. And what this means is that property rights don't have to be absolute. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be ordained by God, mm -hmm. whether or not you believe in one. They don't have to be inherent in the universe. 
They don't have to be something we discover. They can be a tool invented for a purpose. And that purpose is we would like to live in a stellar empire instead of in grass huts. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we have to incentivize investment. Mm -hmm. So that's what this notion of property rights are for. And civilization will progress. People will do useful work yes. to the precise extent that this invented notion of property rights is respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's such it's a it's a bit abstract, and that's why I think people struggle with it. But it there's nothing more essential, right? There's nothing yeah. more essential. Like yeah. Mises yeah. says. You know, yeah. if it's one thing history can teach us, it's that property rights and civilization are inexorably yeah. linked. Yeah. Ayn Rand says yeah. the foundation of all human rights is property rights. Yeah, but they predate civilization. They, they predate, predate humanity. And this is what it is. Property I, rights are, if I may, yes. property rights here are so necessary that they were invented long before evolution invented humans. Yes. If you don't think animals have an evolved in notion of property yes. that I suggest you go get a beehive with a stick. Exactly. <laughs> what happens? <laughs> That's exactly where I was going with this is, <laughs> you know, are but pre yeah. linguistic cultural norms and it's universal, right? This isn't specific to certain yeah. cultures. We see yeah. this. It's hardwired in. It's hardwired yeah. in. I think you could, if you wanted to do such a vile experiment, you know, raise babies without teaching them language, mm -hmm. you know, without teaching them anything, without teaching them any sort of culture whatsoever. You could have these totally feral children. Mm -hmm. And if there were some toys in the, in yeah. like the feral children compound, children would start having a notion of what was their toy and what was somebody else's toy. That's right. And they would fight over this. 100%. It's my hypothesis is that, uh, and this is based on an older book called The Territorial Imperative that talks about all animals having this, not, not all animals, all social animals have a territorial instinct. It seems like we enshrined the territorial instinct in a social institution and we call it private property. Yeah. Right? This idea that this is my land, this is my yeah. whatever. Yeah. Stuff. Well, this is my land because I built a house on it. Yes. I invested in it. I improved the land. Yes. And it's not. That's why, that's why you often have clashes in, in notions of territoriality when you have Paleolithic cultures e encountering, say, Neolithic or later culture. Correct. Because hunter-gatherers, like a great amount of you know American Indian tribes mm -hmm. when they were contacted mm -hmm. by European civilization, hunter gatherers don't invest in land. That's right. So these agrarianists, these these people who build buildings and you know farm land and do these things, yeah. come along and they say, well, you know, we want to homestead this land. You have a fundamental clash of values yes. because hunter gatherers will control land yeah. and will defend it against other hunter gatherers, but they don't invest in it. Yeah, that's right. So they don't fully understand what's going on with the agriculture sometimes until, yeah. you know, they start getting pushed out. And, this and is then another somebody case. comes along and says, whose land is this? Right. Well, somebody habitually controlled it. Yeah. And then somebody came along and invested in it. So it kind of muddies the waters a bit. But the, the point of property rights is to motivate investment. Yes. And that example is another case of different technological paradigms giving rise to different ideologies, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. Hunters and gatherers don't need private property rights in the land because they don't need to own or invest in the land, whereas ag agrarian... Yeah, well, not, not in land. You know, yes. they, they, have a, they have a notion of private property. Right. 
and horses and tools. They tend and to yeah. think of land as being something a little bit like the Ammonized. Yeah. You know, we don't have arguments in our culture over who owns this oxygen. Right. Because it blankets the planet. Yeah. Now, when we start living in space habitats, air might be owned by people. Yes. Yes. <laughs> because exactly. then all of a sudden it takes work. It's yeah. scarce and it yeah. takes work to create. Exactly. Uh, Hoppe takes the property rights argument maybe a little a layer deeper on the philosophical front. Yeah. He said, even in the hypothetical land of milk and honey where we have resolved all economic scarcity, right? We can just wish for whatever we want. He said we would still need private property rights because we have physical bodies and physical space. We yes. can't occupy the yes. same space at the same time. And we also we have, have intellectual property. Yeah. We we spend a great deal of time coming up with creative ideas. I spent a year writing this book that I am now holding up on screen for those of you who are listening, mm -hmm. Theft of Fire by Devin Erickson. You know, took me a year to write that. Mm -hmm. If I didn't have the ability to control that idea and profit off of it, then I wouldn't do it. It would be too much work for nothing. Yeah. And so now you have this condition where even if you have this post-scarcity Star Trek replicator society where you can manufacture any physical object you can imagine by snapping your fingers and giving the computer an order, mm -hmm. you still need this notion of property rights because somebody has to design things mm -hmm. and somebody has to write stories and some some people need to do idea work, intellectual work. They need to come up with stuff and they still need to be able to to own that yeah. and to to generate some form of benefit from it. Now, obviously, it wouldn't be exchanged for these non-scarce physical objects, but they would need to be rewarded in some way. Yeah, this is a conversation I'm not qualified to have, but there are many libertarians that believe since ideas are non-scarce, that they can't be assigned property rights. No, that's bullshit. But that's if, if yeah. you if you think that ideas are non-scarce, try going on Amazon and finding a good book to read. What do you mean by that? I mean, go get on Amazon. There's a, there's a lot of books out there. Mm -hmm. A lot of them aren't very good. You know, the oh, publishing gotcha. industry has collapsed. You know, try finding something that's really fun to read. Why do science fiction writers have fans? Because ideas are scarce. Mm. You know, it takes work to come up with them. Mm. Work is not in infinite supply. How could ideas possibly be in infinite supply? These people are confusing scarcity with effort involved in copying. Yeah, I think that is... It requires zero effort to right. copy an idea right. that's stored in a computer. Right. Well, you know, let the, it's fractions of a penny. And that's the strict right. definition of yeah. economic scarcity they're working from, is if yeah. supply exceeds demand, then it's not scarce. So if you can replicate an idea ad infinitum, then it's uh -huh. by definition non-scarce. Uh -huh. However, but yeah, that's, I don't want that's to get sidetracked. Yeah, uh, because I don't, I'm not yeah. qualified to have the debate. Uh -huh. I want to focus on this connection. So universalized individual private property rights. We made it up, right? It's just a yep. social construct. I guess it's that's the technology. right term. It's a it's, social it, technology. It is a technology. Right. Like money even, right? Although money has kind of a physical instantiation. So there's a, a bit of a hybrid there, but only individual private property rights are optimized for the tightness of feedback loops and price yeah. discovery, right? Like you can't, there's no other form of, there's no communist, so far, private, no communist yeah. property rights that yeah. do that. So, so far, that is there's the only object, technology. Yes. Yeah. So far, that is the only technology that we have come up with that supports an optimal rate of investment. Yes. 
Every, every other thing we've tried, every time we've tried to say, you know, can't we tweak property rights just a little bit to, to allow us to redistribute things, to allow us to, to give according to need, yes, to give according to labor right. instead of to give according to value, right? Then every time we've done that, it's resulted in a degradation of civilization and a degradation of technological progress. Yes, because what we call civilization is really a tech stack. Yes, bingo. So there is a, I guess the. The punchline here, subjectively constructed, but objectively constrained, right? There are systems yeah. of private property that work and those of other forms of property that don't. Just like there are math forms of mathematics that work better than others, right? We ended up with a Hindu Arabic numeral system because it outcompeted yeah. all the other yeah. numeral systems. Yeah. Just like there are forms of money that work and others that don't. So we end yes. up with, you know, gold or digital gold, yes. whatever it may be. Um, and I, the only other point there that I think is really important is private property is also a key element, if not the element, the central element of dis nonviolent dispute resolution. So if we don't want to fight to the death over every sandwich, we have to have some kind of system of dispute resolution, right? And that's where the yeah. rule of law basically yeah. is a tech stack yeah. on top of property yeah. rights. We need, yeah, we need more than the notion of property rights. Yeah. But we have to, the st property rights are the first piece of the puzzle. Yes. You know, you know, we need dispute resolution systems on top of that. But in order to even have those, you know, we, we can't, we can't even have an outcome unless we have some notion of property rights. You yes. know, if, if, if there's a, a strip of land between our neighboring properties mm -hmm. and I'm going to sue you because I think it's my land instead of your land, you know, instead of us getting out and trying to stomp on each other's heads. Yes. We, if we're going to have a system like that, the very idea that I'm saying it's mine and you're saying, no, it's mine means we have a notion of property rights. Exactly. Exactly. No, we can't get anywhere without that. Yes, exactly. So uh, yeah, excellent points on all the above. All right. I want to Ooh, I'm going to circle back to something we talked about a little bit earlier, but then we'll try to bring it back into the context of the current conversation. We said earlier in that first response to the tweet we read where the young lady used the word should three times. Yes. That actually you said that the translation of that term is often meant, or meant to be. You could translate that term as I want, right? She yeah. wants a hundred thousand dollar a year salary yeah. because she got a PhD in yeah. Yeah. whatever it was, psychology. Yeah. It's a way of trying to trick people essentially into, mm -hmm. into believing that her personal wants are a universal moral imperative. Yes. And that's what I wanted to ask you because when we were prepping for this offline, you said this was a confusion mm -hmm. of the Kantian categorical imperative for a hypothetical imperative. Maybe I have yeah. that backwards. Yeah. yeah. Could you elaborate uh, on what yeah, these yeah, are? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Immanuel Kant, and uh, he, he goes on a lot about these things because he was, he was sort of trying to reach conclusions that he had already decided upon. Mm -hmm. And his big thing was that there were two types of imperatives. There was a hypothetical imperative. Mm -hmm. That's an imperative based on a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. I want to loosen this bolt, therefore I should turn it to the left. Mm -hmm. So the hypothetical is if you want to loosen this bolt. Mm -hmm. And then the should comes in, you know, you should turn it to the left and that will loosen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and then he decided, because he was a Christian and he was trying to derive Christianity from pure thought, mm -hmm. which has never worked, um, or any other religion, he said, okay, but then there are categorical imperatives. Mm -hmm. That which I must do independent of any hypothetical. Mm. And 
This this idea of categorical imperatives is something that has plagued human civilization for uh, thousands of years. You know, since it's existed, mm-hmm. this idea that and and you know, if, what I would ask about this is why is it that everyone who talks to God always seems to get told exactly what it is they want to hear? Mm. You know. Every time someone is asked to give a, a categorical imperative, mm-hmm. you know, as transmitted by a higher power or as derived from philosophical principles, it always seems to be very, very similar to that person's hypothetical imperatives mm. to, to their personal goals. You know, the Pope is telling us that God says everyone should obey the Pope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my way of looking at this is that it's hypothetical imperatives all the way down. Hmm. It's just that there are some hypothetical imperatives that we all share, Hmm. like property rights. Mm -hmm. We would like to live in a multi-planetary civilization instead of in grass huts on the Serengeti. Mm -hmm. Therefore, hypothetical imperative, Mm -hmm. we need property rights. Mm -hmm. So, it is possible to derive moral systems that work Mm -hmm. purely from what our goals are. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to live in a high trust society where people are not trying to murder me. Yeah. My sandwich. Therefore, I must behave in a certain way. And I must persuade others to behave in a certain way. Mm. And this, so this sort of notion of categorical imperatives, Mm -hmm. which this young lady is appealing to, is actually sort of a very kind of primitive moral technology Mm -hmm. in the same way that tokens of exchange are a primitive monetary technology Mm -hmm. and armored knights are a primitive technology of force. Mm -hmm. And what makes them primitive is that a few people control them. If you have a central lexicon of what is right and wrong and you write it down in a book, and you have a guy with a hat who who says that he talks to God, then your, you know, your set of morals are under the control of one person. Mm -hmm. And that one person is capable of malfeasance. Mm. But if you construct your morals with hypothetical imperatives then it distributes control over what the morality is a lot more broadly. Mm. And it's a lot harder for bad actors to hack your morality system. Mm. And so what I wrote to this young lady can be seen as sort of an immune response from society at large where I'm acting as a Mm T-cell. And you have imposed... (laughs) A, a bad moral idea and mm-hmm. put it out there into into the body of civilization. Mm-hmm. Let me come along and mark this with an antibody mm-hmm. so that it may be destroyed. Mm-hmm. Because the idea that she is entitled to a six-figure salary simply for acquiring an advanced degree, mm-hmm. whether or not that benefits anyone else, mm-hmm. is a poisonous idea. Mm-hmm. It poisons the body of civilization. It mm-hmm. poisons the tech stack. Mm-hmm. So we must resist that. Mm-hmm. This is fantastic. Um, I want to, I don't know if I'm pushing back or not, but let, give me room to just get it all out there and then let's see where we where we connect. So I would like to propose that perhaps private property is a hybrid of categorical and hypothetical imperatives. And here's my reasoning. So as you said earlier, 
we have to state the end before we can use that word should, right? Before we can prescribe a course of action, yeah, we have to be upfront with what end are we trying to attain. Yeah. So I might say something like, if we want peace, economic prosperity, freedom of exploration, then we should universalize private property. Okay. Um, now this, I would say, is perhaps equivalent to a biblical commandment like thou shall not steal, right? Because sort of what private property is saying is thou yeah, shall not steal, yeah. basically. Yeah. You could extend it to thou shall not kill, kill when you consider people have yeah. property rights yeah. in their physical yeah. body, yeah. for instance. Exactly. So, but this particular thing, right? So it, it's, it's, it's in that way, it's a hypothetical imperative. I'm stating if you want to, un, if you want to loosen the bolt, turn it to the left, right? If you want peace, prosperity, freedom of exploration, then universalize yeah. private property. Yeah. However, it's derived from an economic axiom. Mm -hmm. And the economic axiom is somewhat obvious, theft yeah. reduces productivity. Yeah. So for every act of theft, yeah. the thief is spending an hour non-productively stealing from a producer that they otherwise could have spent producing. So aggregate- And disincentivizing production. And it disincentivizes production. Bingo. Yeah. So it's it's a hypothetical imperative derived from an economic axiom. So yeah. does that then make it a categorical or moral imperative as well? Okay. okay, I think I see where you're going with this. And if I can jump in here. Please. Um, let us- let us not confuse the categorical with the universal. Okay. So the categorical imperative is this idea that this is the moral code engraved on the atoms of the universe. Mm -hmm. The universal imperative is like the hypothetical imperative that we all agree on. Mm. Okay. So... We all want to live in a high trust civilization. Right. That's 99% of us. 1% of us wants to parasitize the high the high trust civilization. Yeah. So this is this is a this is what I would call a universal imperative. It's like 99% of us agree on mm -hmm. this. And the other 1%, they're bad actors. And we are going to make an agreement as the 99% that we're going to go kick their ass. Mm. Mm. We're going to physically remove them. And we're going to, if necessary, violate their personal autonomy. Right. Their property rights over their own body. Because they don't believe in ours. In response to their violation. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yes. It's like, it's like, why should I respect your property rights according to my principles? Yeah. If you don't respect my property rights. Right. Yeah. You know, this is a this is a uh, a sort of an emergent pact. Yeah. You know, so we can we can say, okay, property rights are absolute, but what that really means is we want them to be absolute mm -hmm. because we want everybody to behave themselves. Mm -hmm. Anarcho-capitalism is not a suicide pact. Right. We don't have to refrain from kicking someone's ass when they're stealing our stuff. Right. You know, and ultimately, civilizations work when we have the principle embedded in them that it is acceptable to use violence to defend property. Mm -hmm. What that it is acceptable to shoot someone who is stealing your car. Mm -hmm. Because when we when we start to say, oh, life is more important than property, then you have a civilization where someone is stealing your stuff and you're standing there with your shotgun helpless yeah. because you will be punished for stopping that person with violence. Right. Then the whole system starts to decay. Yeah. So what we do is we construct a universal imperative, which is respect everybody's individual property rights 
or we, the vast majority of people who know how to act so we can have nice things mm -hmm. are going to kick your ass. Mm. Got it. Okay. So there is a, ultimately, ultimately you have to be able to resort to force. Yeah. You know, we want to make force unprofitable. Yes. But ultimately when people try to steal things that can be stolen, yeah. we must resort to force. Yes. We also see this in the animal kingdom once again, yeah. right? Where yeah, I get a beehive with a stick. Yeah, well, I had a guy on. They'll kick your Jason, ass. Jason Lowry. He has a whole thesis yeah. about power projection, and he talked about that being the evolutionary purpose of antlers, or yeah. so that deers could like have combat over territory and spouses. Yeah, in yeah. a non-lethal way, right? So yeah. this this idea of non-lethal dispute resolution is actually yeah. a really useful technology, yeah. right? Yeah. Because violence yeah. is very expensive and dangerous and risky. Yeah. The the it should be a measure of last resort, basically. Yeah. And so to the extent we can make it a measure of last resort is the extent to which we all become more productive and prosperous yeah. and peaceful. Yeah. Yeah. And the extent to which we make it ineffective for gaming the system. Yes. Try to develop technologies whereby property cannot be stolen. Yes. Technologies that do not require everyone to voluntarily comply with yes. property rights. But... Ultimately, civilization exists at all because human beings are a social animal. Yeah. And the vast majority of us are pro-social. Yes. You know, that is the ultimate refutation to socialism is, is that socialism is based on the assumption that people are evil. Yes. And they yeah. need yes. to be controlled to make them act virtuously. And that is simply not the case because you wouldn't have a civilization if it were. Thing you know, you never would have been able to build anything. And you're front you running know? me here on the next point, yeah. which is yeah. exactly the, where I'm the going. Real, the, real, the real case is that a very, very, very high percentage of people are pro-social and what we would call good. Yes. And for civilization to happen... What has to what has to happen is they have to physically constrain those few who are not. No. You know, it's yes. it's you can run society in two ways. You can either run it like a prison, yeah, where you treat everyone as untrustworthy, or you find the people who are untrustworthy and you throw them in prison yeah. and you let everybody else get on with that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Um that is actually, that's the last point I want to go into is that idea of, of the, the premise of socialism. But one, I want to put a button on this very fruitful conversation about private property rights. And we're using a lot of biological metaphors here, but I think they're very apt. Yeah. So if we can- so it comes from bio. It comes from, it's almost like a, col yes, it, it, again, feedback loops govern biological interface with environment. And then this is like- we're talking about feedback loops at the collective organism scale, right? Oh, yes. The civilizational scale. Yes. Adaptation, I hope this is the right definition, the conformity of an organism to the selection pressures of its environment, right? So it's taking feedback from its environment and becoming more fit for survival and reproduction. Yes. yes. Adaptation thus requires the dissemination of information, right? If the feedback loops were blocked or distorted or whatever, yeah. so otherwise dysfunctional, the organism yeah. could not adapt yeah. to the selection yeah. pressures. Well, in what the are we case saying of... with the last one here? What are we saying with universalized private property? Is we're optimizing for civilizational adaptivity, yeah. right? Yeah. So the yeah. information is being yeah. propagated yeah. through price signals, yeah. tight feedback yeah. loops, etc. Well, in the case of evolution, you're dealing with a feedback loop that can't be blocked, right? Because evolution sculpts by subtraction you know you die yes so you right. can't say excuse me universe i would like to ignore this feedback and not die i was thinking of the example that if someone <laughs> say you yeah. heard yeah. something yeah. and then you eat a bunch of yeah. painkillers yeah. yeah and you anesthetize yeah. yourself yeah but that's well, that's culture that's not evolution. right okay. okay okay so the goal is to be open to feedback on a cultural level 
so that you don't have to be open, so that you don't have to get your feedback on an evolutionary level, because that means you die. Yes. Right. So you can voluntarily accept feedback right. or you can involuntarily accept Got feedback. It. And anytime you, you voluntarily, you inhibit your voluntary feedback loops, right. you're going to get the same result on your involuntary feedback loops and it's going to hurt a lot more. Right. Bingo. Okay. This is, this is fantastic. It reminds me of that quote that it's much more cost effective to learn from the mistakes of others rather than learn from your own mistakes, right? If you can absorb yeah. feedback from the culture, yeah. from other people's yeah. experiences, yes. sources yeah. of knowledge, then you don't have to feel the pain. Yeah. yeah. Um, easier said than done, of course, but yeah. there. <laughs> okay. Uh, so in the last Twitter response we were going to look at of yours today, you're talking about, I'm not really sure. So the, the, Response was, who does Moore think is the hero in the story? Oh, you're talking about the Rorschach. Test. Yes, yes, I'm yes. talking there about, a, yeah. Uh, what is the movie called? The Watchman. The Watchman. Okay. Yes. It's based on a comic book. Yes. And so I'll, I guess I don't know what part of this I should read. Um, I, I don't know. Actually, I'll let you, you're familiar with this post because oh, I think yeah, I'd have yeah, to yeah, read the yeah, whole thing. Yeah. No, I know I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. There was a uh there there was a discussion a widespread discussion on Twitter over some comment the author, Alan Moore, made mm -hmm. about a character named Rorschach, you know, having been intended as a critique of some ideas that he felt were fascist. Mm -hmm. And he was very nonplussed by people identifying with this character who had a moral code and stuck to it. And, uh, you know, he felt, he felt that this guy was sort of a smelly outcast and, didn't deserve to be listened to. Hmm. And then, you know, people were coming along and saying, no, actually this, this guy is a hero mm -hmm. because he stood on principle against other characters in the comic book saying, yes, this plan we have is going to kill millions of innocent people, mm -hmm. but it's for the greater good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a socialist, Moore is sort of generally in favor of these utopian plans mm -hmm. that serve the greater good. And, you know, so he, he created this character that was supposed to represent what he calls fascism, which mm -hmm. is basically anti-socialism and mm -hmm. this notion that, you know, it's, it's sort of wrong to kill, you know, mm -hmm. kill lots of innocent people. And... You know, I felt that this this discussion kind of, uh, you know, uh, what I said was the character of Rorschach is 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 a Rorschach test mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. It's it's you know you whether you see him as a hero or a villain or something in between depends on what your basic model of the universe mm -hmm. is. It's like a psychological mirror. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so somebody asked me, you know, are you, who do, who do you think, uh, Alan Moore thinks is the hero of the story? And I said, well, I don't think, I don't think from his socialistic worldview, he believes in heroes. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole idea, the reason people embrace systems of central control is that they believe is that they either are grifters and manipulators and they want to control people or they believe that humanity is evil and needs to be controlled mm -hmm. you know this is this is really the answer to why so many educated intellectual intelligent people are socialists mm -hmm. the answer is that socialism doesn't appeal to the intellect mm. it appeals to the intellectual Mm -hmm. 
intellectuals love to come up with plans mm -hmm. for the betterment of society because an intellectual and Aon, I'm using Thomas Sowell's definition of an intellectual mm -hmm. here, someone whose work product is ideas. Yeah. You know, their whole work product is ideas. So their whole modus operandi is to spit out ideas about how society should be run. Right. You know, you have your few, you know, sort of Austrian school intellectuals <laughs> whose ideas is this is why society should not be run. <laughs> Let it do its thing. Yeah. Um, but mo mostly their 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 work product is grandiose plans yes. for right. the greater good. And so the centralization of power appeals to them very much because this yeah. gives them a tool with which to implement their plans. Yeah. If you don't have a, a big hand that moves all the little people around like chess pieces, yeah. then what is there for the intellectual to do? Yeah. You know, you know, and so Marx said that religion was the opiate of masses. Yeah. And I would submit that Marxism is the opiate of academia. Mm. It's this thing that they shoot into their veins that tells them you are important. You are smarter than everyone else. You know what is right for everybody. Yes. Move people around like chess pieces. Implement the perfect society. Yeah. It's just like solving a math problem in elementary school where your mom patted you on the head and told you you were a smart boy. And so... The temptation of that for someone in this zone of, say, IQ 115 to 135 or so is almost irresistible. Mm -hmm. It's like the one ring. Mm -hmm. You know, the, into, the, the socialist intellectuals out there are, are, are standing out there screaming, I ask only for the strength to save my people. And... You know, the the rest of us are saying, no, this thing is evil. Don't touch it. It destroys everything it touches. Yeah. The strength to save your people lies within your people themselves. Yes. Trust them. Empower them. Yes. Don't control them. Draw strength from them. Yes. That's, that's beautiful. Beautifully said. Um and to tie this back to what we were saying earlier and maybe add a bit more color, again, Hoppe defined socialism as an institutionalized policy of aggression against private property. You're saying here that socialism is based on the fundamental belief that humans are evil or humans are fundamentally yes. evil. Yes, because who do you need to aggress against? Who do you need to use violence against? And people who don't act right. Exactly. So going beyond the hypocrisy of the prescribed solution to controlling people that are fundamentally evil is to assign other people who are fundamentally evil to govern them. Yes. All right. That obviously is a non-starter, but we'll yeah. just pass that aside. Uh, the, the, the definition of evil in the book Paradise Lost, Lost is evil is the force which believes its knowledge is complete. So these socialist Marxist intellectuals are people that think their ideas are so good mm. that they must be imposed. They must be, they must be mandatory. By yeah. force, by, yes. through the violation of private property, yes. actually, yeah. through yeah. socialism. So yeah. Yeah. this is the, this is like this, yeah. this, yeah. this inherent That's fatal the conceit, yeah. you know, this, yeah. this, and it's, yeah. they're trying to, they're trying to denounce evil or extinguish evil by perpetrating evil. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in reality, the world is very complex and we make mistakes in our thinking all the time, right. which is why we want to distribute this processing. Yes. And we can't approach the universe by just, you know, folding our hands and saying, it is known Khaleesi. 
Yeah. You know, we, we have to constantly re-examine our ideas yes. and a constant flow of empirical feedback yes. allows us to do that. Yes. But anarcho-capitalism, libertarianism, yeah. capitalism, you know, freedom, liberty, whatever you yeah. want to call it, yes. is the assumption that most people are pro-social. Yeah. And we only need to direct violence against the few people who don't act right. And socialism, collectivism, Marxism, you know, this top-down control philosophies mm -hmm. are basically the idea that most, that humanity is by nature antisocial and we need to direct violence against everyone. Mm -hmm. Which is an anti-human idea, fundamentally. Yeah. And the, the, yeah. The, there's a bit yeah. of a paradox here, perhaps, because the right idea, I think we would argue, is that we should respect the limitations of ideas, right? Respect the yeah. limitations of language and knowledge. Like, there is no yeah. final answer or final solution. Therefore, we actually need... Well, if there is, so, we don't have it. Well, I mean, the closest thing yeah. we can say is perhaps private property, right? It's like, which is say, let people be free... Everyone yeah. mind their own business. Let people self-organize. Yeah. Let's have tight yeah. feedback loops. Yeah. Well, that's an idea that is is pretty sound. You know, it's it's like it's the cornerstone of our building, and it's carried a lot of weight for a lot of time, and we can probably rely on that. One. Yeah. You know, we're putting in. We need to put in other bricks to build a structure, and some of those we may, you know, maybe those don't work out so well. We need to yeah. tear them down. But I think we can have a, a high degree of confidence in that one cornerstone. Yeah. And the socialist wants to do away with the cornerstone. Yeah. Yeah. Devin, this has been um, one hell of a conversation. Uh, yeah, it's been fun. Very wide ranging, very fun. Um, I, you know, uh, thank you. I don't know. This is really, really good stuff. I, I look forward to reading your book. Oh, thank you. I, I love doing this. I could ramble about this stuff all day. <laughs> okay. Uh, and my agent will will <laughs> will murder me in my sleeve if I don't hold this up again. There it is again. The for boys. those of you who are only listening, this is my debut science fiction novel, first of a series of four, Theft of Fire by Devin Erickson, available almost wherever books are sold. <laughs> we'll link to that in the show notes. Um Devin, where can people find you on the internet? Um, mostly on Twitter. I have a website, devinerickson.com, which has links to basically wherever I am. But a lot of my little random thoughts and snippets of writing happen on Twitter. Devin underscore Erickson underscore. And that's really sort of the the stream of consciousness stuff that eventually pe convinces people that yes maybe i can write and they should try the book <laughs> it certainly worked for me um i'm really excited to read the book really enjoyed this conversation we'll have to do this again i think there's yeah, a yeah. lot of i would love to holes i would love down. to so um thank you again for your time and well, until thank next you time for